Shalom from Jerusalem. Mahalo wa salam. Salam. This is our Middle East. Our shakar al satlana. Man. Together. Jews and Arabs. Kurds. Baluchis. Turkmen's, Christians. Muslims. Everyone's Middle East. Uh, this is a show about turning the Middle East inside out and understanding the Middle East in her own image with uh, so much uh, breadth and depth to the region that we haven't seen before. And today we're going to be talking about can we add the Palestinians and the Jordanians to the growing circle of peace? Until now, the Jordanians and the Palestinians, are they obstinate opponents or are they pliable partners? <laughs> Abdullah Junaid, welcome. Abdullah Junaid is the Deputy Director of MENA uh, 2050, Middle East, North Africa 2050, a visionary organization. And uh, Abdullah, I think it's fair to say you're a visionary commentator and analyst and journalist. You've been on every network possible in the West. We're lucky enough to have you on our Middle East today. We were talking about, uh, before we came into the studio, uh, the, the real opportunities versus the obstacles of our Palestinian and Jordanian neighbors. How do you bring them into the Abrahamic Accords, uh, uh, the circle of peace? What are the, it, it's a specific challenge that is not known, uh, that, that wasn't really part of the Gulf-Israel relationship, but it's a unique situation, is it not? Dan, first of all, thank you for uh, the invitation to join you on this podcast. And definitely what we need to do is addressing issues from our own perspective. When I, and when I say our collective perspective, I'm talking about all the people of this region, countries. We want everybody's input, assistance. It's not just government to government. We need people to people at all levels, organizations. We need to um, foster a new understanding. We, it is us who are gonna change, protect, this region together. It's not going to be anybody, nor the Chinese, nor the American. Uh, they have their own interests. But for us, the challenges that any country will be facing is going to be shared or impacting the others. Now, can we change certain realities? I believe uh, Jordan could be, uh, you know, present uh, a zone that could foster in new ideas where everybody from the region could join hand and work with the, uh, let's say, uh, stakeholders through models like uh, water for electricity that was approached by UAE. Why should we stop at that? We need to build more models based on that. Your view from as an analyst for many years on this issue has been uh, that the regional approach, meaning all of the family members in the region must really join hands and approach it as a region of family members, as opposed to just individual interests that that uh, many times had created, you know, was kind of resistance from one player to the other player. And on the Palestinian Jordanian, and I, and I really grouped them together because it created a particular challenge for the region because they have unique you know, the king faces unique challenges in Jordan and the Palestinian issue was always sort of the Palestinians and the, the Israelis. It was sort of like we were uh, kind of uh, uh, unfriendly Siamese twins to one another. How, how did you see from where you sit in Bahrain and, and your colleagues in the Gulf, how did you see the, the challenge of the Palestinian Jordanian um, file in bringing them into the region? What were the difficulties as you saw them to bring them in? Okay, let's start with uh, what we're talking about, uh, driving uh, down to the uh, studio. You mentioned a model that was shaped collectively or jointly by the uh, entrepreneur, Palestinians and Israelis, where they joined hand and developed something that was providing and that is providing high level of income to Israelis and Palestinians. Oh, you're talking about the 16 industrial exactly. centers in area C of the West exactly. Bank. Exactly. That, this is one of the models. Uh, before I, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, before I, I left Bahrain, there was an announcement of um, a venture capital uh, Israeli uh, company that's setting up base or operation in Bahrain. And it is targeting, uh, you know, uh, mid-level sort of businesses and so on. We have a lot of other things. Could you imagine if this venture capital fund goes into the project that is earmarked in Iraq, uh, Jordan, uh, Bahrain, UAE, Saudi Arabia, I believe we could attract further uh, investment, direct investment, uh, address issues like uh, level of income for those individual and in either in Jordan or anywhere else, we, we've heard about Saudi Arabia uh, starting up the um, its sovereign fund, starting something in Iraq, and the seed money was something over $3 billion. Now, the opportunities are massive, and now a model of this company that was established in Bahrain doesn't need to stay in Bahrain or just target uh, startups in, in, in UAE and uh, the Gulf. They could venture out, and this is the strategic, uh, what Bahrain provide as a hub for something like this. Absolutely. You know, the, 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 what they call the regional approach allows conflicts in a way to not dissolve completely, but let's call them depreciate or amortize, because when you know you have many other um, stakeholders in the region behind a much larger idea based on uh, prosper mutual prosperity, shared prosperity, uh, shared pathways to security and to stability. Then in a way it can give um, the, all the Jordanians and the Palestinians a way of, as they say in uh, the English expression is walking, is coming down the tree. It was because everyone is so high up in the high branches of the tree of the conflict that they've been in for so many decades. Uh, there is a you know possibility of 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 thinking outside the boxes you've said very well and and joining um, a new regional uh, approach. How, how can I know, you know the the Bahrainis uh, have been very helpful and His Excellencies the leaders of of Bahrain have been very very helpful in, uh, in uh, forging this sort of regional approach with Israel even well before the Abraham Accords were signed. Um, what what how can we work together in a way to encourage our Palestinian Jordanian neighbors to join to join the circle and 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 think a little bit outside of the box moving forward? Again, His Majesty, when he decided, first of all, Bahrain is the only uh, GCC country that has indigenous Jewish community, you know, Bahrainis, and um, and tell you the truth, that was one of the uh, drivers of, uh, you know, uh, approaching uh, uh, the, the uh, Abrahamic Accords or the uh, workshop that was held in Bahrain back in 2018 for the future of Palestine or Palestinians. What we need is further. Uh, something like this venture capital uh, company, Israeli company, sitting base, original operation in Bahrain, could be the uh, bouncing board for others, but what we need to do is, let, let's say again, I'll go back to the water for electricity. We can probably uh, convince the Jordanian and the Israelis and the uh, Emiratis to take this uh, bridging and turn it into a public, uh, public uh, company. And we start inviting the minute people gonna see uh, this, we, we have a lot of other opportunities. Uh, the Jordanian are very good in the healthcare uh, system and services. We need to invest in that because they could provide and get, uh, bridge a gap uh, for the Iraqis. Uh, Syria is going to be very critical when we start moving there to stabilize uh, the Syrian, you know, if and when they reach an agreement, they will need a lot of services. The Jordanian are in opposition, uh, probably the Israelis are not. But could you imagine this, the, the Jordanian playing a leading role in this? So 
medical services is going to be a critical for that. And the models or the ideas are massive. But what we need to do is just be brave enough, government and private sector, or taking our hand off the private sector, we tell them, go, work. How, how much of an obstacle is the constant looming cloudy sky that the, that, uh, the Iranian regime uh, has uh, cast upon upon the whole region. Is there a way of uh, of um, uh, dealing with that without, you know, full 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 fledged conflict? Unfortunately, uh, weaponizing sectarianism within, or let's say, after the invasion of Iraq tw- uh, two thousand three, have changed the uh, landscape uh, socially uh, in so many areas, but this is, I believe, more dangerous weapon in the hand of the Iranians than any other weapon, including their dreams of becoming a nuclear uh, power. And it's not going to happen, or we, we all know that. But the present time, Iran's main strategy, uh, let's say, goal, was to maintain and sustain as much of failed political, social geography within the Arabic region. And this, if it's continue, it's going to be uh, not just uh, playing in the hand of, of Iran, but it's going to be playing in the hand of so many other future potential uh, enemies of the region. And it's going to be our top priority now to address the issue of Restabilizing the region by all means, collectively. The minute we start working, and this is what the Saudis are doing and the UAE doing in Iraq, giving, not giving just aid, but direct investment, bringing private sector to work, bringing, uh, you know, sovereign fund to uh, make sure that the governance tools are there, to make sure that the money goes to, in the right, to the right target. We can do that again. So, priority number one regionally at the present time is restabilizing by all means. Then we go on to a transition. Nobody could convince me that the Lebanese could carry out a real, uh, you know, uh, transition from the crisis they are suffering for the past, I don't know how many years. They, In 76, sure. Exactly. So, they need to believe that for them, to overcome this, and the Syrian as well, is to have a collective transitional plan supervised by regional partners and maybe the UN. But without agreeing to that, it's going to be difficult for anybody else to go and invest in failed models. So here you have a major challenge, of Abdelazanid, and that is the United States-led Western Alliance has seen the Middle East really through the binoculars that the Palestinian Authority, the PLO, the Fatah have have manufactured for them. And, you know, when one, uh, both being residents of the region, I mean, you were born in the region, I was born in the West, but having become, I call myself a student of the region, having really taken the zoom out to really try to understand the the Middle East within its own context, you see that the West frequently makes mistakes about how they see the Middle East. Perhaps they see it through their own eyes, or they've been convinced by the Palestinians to see it through their eyes. Where, where, where can the the U.S.-led Western Alliance see the the Europeans also see the Western see the the Middle East in more and a more accurate, objective way? I think what we need to understand is one thing: when and how. The, the when is important. Was when the Saudis announced. Vision 2030, and it was, in a way, in certain area, was conflicting with what the uh, U.S. vision for the region. But the Saudis put their foot down and said, it's time, are we going to do it? The UAE done the same. Uh, now, those two countries are a shining model of uh, national, uh, you know, uh, collective will, or, uh, uh, you know, putting us, the region, first. It's not for the U.S. And let's 
compare two approaches. We all heard about the uh, Iran uh, Saudi deal um, under the Chinese umbrella, but everybody assumed that the Saudis have done that just to despite the American. And actually, it is totally wrong. The Saudi did it because the Chinese put, you know, table guarantees and then being the guarantor of the Iranian regime. That's why the Saudis accepted after such a long uh, negotiation, uh, window of negotiation that, that lasted over three years or so. So when the circumstances are right, we, it is us collectively, Israelis and the rest of us, need to tell the American or whoever it is, it is us, not you, who dictates what needs to be done. Issues need to be addressed. Uh, I was just in Germany, uh, at, you know, part, taking part in the... Uh, in the conference uh, in Berlin. Yeah. It, was called, it is the annual event. And uh, I was one of the moderators of the um, uh, sessions. And I put this question to one of the Bundestag members. And I told them, what does the security of the Mediterranean means to you? You and everybody else knew very well where the death uh, boats were the departure point. But so, so far, nobody moved that finger to go and make those doing that accountable. We know the roots of the migrants, where they are taken, who is you know, the whole details. Why the European are still? Is it because somebody else interests? Or you're going to continue? If they need to talk about interdependence, and I, I one of those who say collective regional will, but interdependency uh, with somebody like Europe is a must for the security of the Middle East. And the security of the Mediterranean need to be addressed by us as well, collectively. Because when, uh, you know, terrorism uh, departed uh, North Africa into Europe, at the end, we all have seen what Daesh did. Absolutely. And now, and we continue to see what the Iranian regime did. I mean, the Wuriyat al the uh, Khamenei, just said this week, it is a strategic goal to destroy Israel, what they call the Zionists, you know, uh, the, the, the root in their view, the Jews are the root, the Jews in Israel are the root of all evil of, of, of the Middle East until, until the region can stand up. And here Israel looks to its lar to its, its, uh, bigger brothers, if you will, in, in Saudi and in the UAE and Bahrain all together as members of, of this Middle Eastern family to say, listen, this, you you're, you're, the propaganda is not going to get you anywhere, and uh, and and you know you're you're going to end up in the dustbin of history if you don't if you don't watch out. But until that happens, in my view, things won't change. You've got this big Iranian regime monster that has proxies in Hezbollah, proxies in Hamas, proxies in Jihad, proxies in the special forces in Iraq, proxies in the Houthis. That for the moment, for the moment in the Houthi situation, they have sort of backed off because of Chinese guarantees and Saudis. But this is still a burning problem of Dada Junaid. We have to, and, and face it, I think it, I think that we would be naive if we ignored and just talk about, you know, the, the positive shared uh, economic pathway to prosperity. Um, when the uh, Iranian attacked uh, Aramco Greek uh, refineries, um, Immediately, I wrote an article. If they can reach a target, uh, you know, close to a thousand kilometers, how long would it take them to launch something from seaborne or landborne? Uh, you know, just adding stages to those rockets and hit target like Elat in Israel. Okay, if we gonna send a message, the message should be direct and clear, the, starting with those boats smuggling arms and narcotics, okay? 
the minute we, you know, uncover such a thing, we need to talk, take those people and try them as terrorists, even if they're carrying out the orders of uh, the Khomeini and his likes, or the, uh, you know, uh, revolutionary guards. We need to make a real example. This is one. Two, we have CENTCOM at the present time. Israel is part of this, uh, of CENTCOM. And we all know that the members of CENTCOM work together at, at all levels. So collectively, I think that had set the base for something far much stronger with the American or without the American. We all know uh, how much it's not just trade between the signee of the Abrahamic Accords in Israel. It is developing into uh, security areas, uh, even talking about replacing certain, certain systems, American system by Israelis. And it is taking place. So the steps towards uh, you know, uh, being security partners, it is there on the ground and it's only going to grow. And we shouldn't be ashamed or need to qualify the reasoning for taking this step. We are partner, we are stake, uh, you know, uh, stakeholders in this region and we shouldn't, and we don't need to explain this to anybody or justify it. We're going to need to do whatever it takes to restabilize this region and everybody better start listening. So, you know, Bahrain and the UAE, the Emirates, are a very compelling example of small countries, successful countries, stable countries, prosperous countries. And you, one looks at, you know, the Palestinian leadership demands, you know, this full-blown a Palestinian state on the 1967 lines, which frankly would threaten uh, existentially, uh, arguably, uh, Israel's existence. Uh, in other words, Israel, I can say authoritatively, even on the right and the center on the political left, has been in favor of historic compromise, but we can't commit suicide. And somehow this idea that, that the Jews won't commit suicide has not filtered into the discussion between our uh, our Arab partners in the Gulf and the Palestinians. So the, what would you say to the Palestinians as a Bahraini who also knows the Emirates very, very well, that they can live like the Hong Kong of the Middle East if they, if they could rethink, reimagine their participation in, as you say, venture funds and economic, you know, in, 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 in a real economic pathway and get off this old you know, um, you know, 70, 75 year, 85 year old narrative that they've been living with. Put it this way, at the present time, the uh, Palestinian suffering is not a commodity, a political commodity that could be sold anymore. The Palestinians need to take charge of their own, you know, affair. Oh, you mean they have to be, they have to take responsibility. This is it. Okay. What they need to do is find out exactly where this or the past have taken them, okay, and seek another alternative. And the alternatives are vast and so many. Now, yeah. two, they need to revisit the King Salman last comment with regard to the Palestinian issue. He made it clear, whatever they agreed upon with the Israelis, Saudi Arabia will agree to it. So, regional will is, at the present time, we're not going to be just fighting the Palestinian fight anymore politically. The Palestinian need to step up, okay, and take their own decision. Because at the present time, this is not elevating any of their suffering. If they are suffering, they can do so much. Uh, certain uh, policies by the Israelis need to be changed to collectively work together, but both of you need to find a path leading to a better tomorrow for both of you. And the minute you decide on that path, you're going to find the whole region is your partner in securing 
the objective of that plan. When you look at the uh, Iranian regime's sponsorship of these Palestinian groups like Hamas, PIJ, uh, and others, Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, do, do you really, do you trust the Iranian regime now that it has re-engaged in diplomatic relations with the Saudis? Do you, do you trust, do you really trust that it can hold? Do you trust that they will, will, will show the dead will that you've shown? First of all, we are not naive. We have been there. And, I mean, I'm talking about how I read the Saudi position. First of all, trust is definitely not on the table. Okay? Two, uh, do we need to address uh, the Hamas or Islamic Jihad or uh, Revolutionary Guards or Hezbollah and the... Uh, the shoots that came out from uh, those uh, organizations all over the place. What we need to do is to start with, find a different tooling to restabilize. If it is, and we need to prove to everybody, including Iran, one, that this is not going to be entertained by anybody anymore. Two, we need to tell, unfortunately, our American friend that they had failed to contain Iran and for them to continue assuming that containing Iran by that sort of means at our cost is not going to be something accommodated by us as well collectively. Three, we need to make sure that our borders are secure, spaces are secure, our cyber spaces are secure. And this, we can't do it individually, but we could borrow from our neighbors, all our, you know, collectively uh, experience and see what needs to be done. You know, the vision of uh, MENA 2050 can be seen even uh, in a more uh, immediate fashion by the Saudis. Uh, I've been saying on this program that Many in the West misunderstand or have not been uh, made aware or not clear enough about the the visionary uh, position and intentions of uh, Mohammed bin Salman. This is a 38 year old man who who sees the vision for the region as being you know uh, Saudi a startup nation, if you will, of the of the Arab world, of the Middle East really being a net exporter of clean energy, of defense systems, of uh, of, of, of water and food security. In other words, th this is a completely different view, right, of the Middle East than, than it has been known in the past. You see, Saudi Arabia is the, um, I always, whenever uh, the Saudi 2030 uh, is brought as part of a discussion, I refer them back to East of Suez, 1957. Okay? This is East of the Suez. It is taking place. Everybody misread what took place then. Now, Saudi Arabia is the center block, Arab capital, and the Islamic capital. What the Saudis are doing, it's a giant, you know, um, gear. And it is starting to turn. And they are presenting a major uh, accomplishment in such a short period. The biggest, uh, I believe, achievement is the social transformation, empowering women. Uh, um, you know, you go now to any hotel in Riyadh or Khobar or Jeddah or any of the major cities, you're going to find Saudi girls, you know, taking your order or at the kitchen or at reception. And uh, you're going to find them openly in, in all sorts of walks of life. Okay. Could you imagine this is happening in less than three or four years, mm -hmm. more than that, Saudi economy have grown from something like 800 billion to almost 1.2 trillion, okay? Now, let, 
just have this in the picture. Israel, close to half a trillion. Abu Dhabi, or UAE is close to that. Saudi is 1.2 trillion. We are already a major economy, okay? With effect within our, you know, direct geography, politically, socially, and everything. And we can provide a solid, stable model at all, you know, to everybody. And even the European now are seriously talking to uh, us or talking to the uh, GCC with a different tone. Previously, they were talking to us, you know, from above. Now, they sit at the same level and talk to us as, you know, partners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's actually a fascinating point because it, it really is the wheels of history are really turning it very, very, uh, very quickly. And, and, you know, people um, in the West are unaware of how this new Middle East in the Abrahamic context sees itself. And I think you see that you were before talking about uh, regionalism and also saying, you know, that when you, if the, if the Saudis do at some point uh, sign some agreement with Israel, it's going to be very, it's going to be a different agreement than the Abraham agreement, because sure. as you said, this is a, this is a kingdom which 1.7 billion Muslims are affected by, right? Sure. This is not just another country. No, no. Most, the, the, the most important thing, what we need to understand is one thing. The Saudis understand very well, and uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman have, have said it clearly. Israel is a potential ally, okay? But both Saudi and Israel are members of Central Command, okay? And they are working together. So bridging a gap may take some time, but my only advice to the Israelis Please don't let this track be part of the American politics as usual or the Israeli politics as usual. I think for the best interest of the whole region is for this track to be left to evolve uh, according to its own sort of motion. There you go. I think you said it just the best. I don't think I should add anything other than saying, to sum up, keep Western politics out of the Middle East. Please. <laughs> Let the Middle East evolve organically to become a full-fledged partner of all these major powers in the Middle East. And boy, are these powers shifting Russia and Iran and China and the United States. There's a chessboard that is, is shifting in the Middle East is looking itself as, as king and queen. Uh, and not just as a rook or a knight in, in, in the shifting. Chain. Listen, uh, Dan, let me tell you, water only runs towards lowlands. We need to reshape this land together, okay? We are not going to be the dumping uh, ground for bad international politics anymore, and we will not accept that to continue. There we have it. Uh... Uh, Abdallah Junaid, uh, the deputy uh, director of MENA 2050 and a world-renowned uh, commentator, journalist. What a pleasure and honor it is to have you in our Middle East. al shak al lana ma'an, together uh, moving the Middle East uh, to redesign the landscape of the Middle East, as you said so eloquently. This has uh, been really a great program and we uh, My pleasure. are honored to have you and a lot to think about as we move forward in an evolving Middle East. Thank you very much. Pleasure is mine. Thank you for inviting me, Dan. Thank you.